For more than a thousand years, students have been gathering in lecture halls to listen to the sage on the stage. But shorter attention spans, new technologies, and empirical testing of learning outcomes have led us to question the tried and true historical transmission model of teaching and learning. This week, join me for a brief lecture on the death of lecture. Let's take 10 and take notes. Almost a thousand years ago, the Université de Bologna was founded in Italy, and it's perhaps the oldest continuously operating educational institution in the world. Aside from the lack of PowerPoint, the 14th century classrooms looked very similar to modern-day lecture theaters. The professors stood at the podium at the front of the room. Students from varying states of attention took notes, fell asleep in the back row, or paid undue attention to members of the opposite sex sitting near them. Modern-day professors are acutely aware that today's undergraduate students find it difficult to sustain their attention, and they become disengaged in a lecture theater. David Helfen, the former president at Quest University, describes how the lecture format is antithetical to the fundamental wiring of the human brain. Education has been about taking beakers of full information in my head and pouring little bits of that information into your head mm -hmm. and asking you to regurgitate it on command to show that you have learned it. The brain is not designed for one-way communication. We have a speech production center and a speech recognition center right here on the left side and they're wired together and they're designed for two-way communication. Okay. And the lecture is the opposite of that. So that, I think, is the critical mistake that most of our ed educational system is based on. The concept is not radically new. In the first century AD, Plutarch observed that the human mind is not a vessel that needs filling, it's wood that needs igniting. 21st century cognitive science applies modern tools like functional MRI to examine the human brain in the process of learning. One such study concluded that once curiosity is aroused, a dopamine spike turns the human brain into a sponge ready to absorb new knowledge at a vastly improved rate. Curiosity is the drive to fill an information gap. The problem with passive learning modes is that curiosity doesn't have a chance to get engaged. Nobel Prize winning physicist Carl Wyman, who studies the issue of undergraduate science teaching and learning, has observed that fundamentally the lecture is ineffectual for learning, and that we have finally found some ways to do it better. Perhaps the need's never been greater to abandon the traditional lecture model. Generation Y and Z have significantly decreased attention spans. Even Gen Xers like me have less attention span than we did 50 years ago. Today's undergraduates simply don't have the patience for a 60 or 90 minute lecture. TED Talks have shown us that 16 minutes is about the threshold for a sustained burst of attention. Many podcasts, MOOCs, and training videos keep themselves to under five minutes. Recently, the organizers of TEDx Talks at Columbia University lamented the increasingly short attention spans of their audience. But how did learning officially die? How did we let it all slip between our fingers? Well, you might say, there was an app for that. Long-form information finally became obsolete. Content over six seconds wasn't being watched. Sharing smart ideas was next to impossible. Even the news had to shorten their format. Welcome to the news at six. Sweden invades Russia. Murder in Manhattan. Weather cold. In sports, win, 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 lose. And Grandma loves baking. Thanks for watching. Good night. There have been hundreds of teaching and learning studies examining the impact and effectiveness of lecture for undergraduates. A meta-analysis published a year or so ago by the National Academy of Sciences concluded that, in fact, students in lecture classes were one and a half times as likely to fail the course as students in active learning models, particularly when there was no lecture at all. Studies like that and personal experience in the classroom have led many academics to declare that the lecture is actually toxic to student learning. So why do modern institutions continue to depend upon the lecture as the primary form for undergraduate instruction? The simple answer is one of economics. Frankly, the revenue generated by large first-year lecture classes subsidizes upper-year seminars, graduate instruction, and even research. 
As per-student funding has continued to drop, institutions have massified lecture theaters since the 1960s to try to make up on volume what they're losing on margin. Most professors and many administrators would agree with Robert Campbell, president at Mount Allison University, when he observes that the quality of undergraduate education has broadly deteriorated within our lifetimes. In the past century, most of the innovation in undergraduate teaching and learning has amounted to little more than scaling an outmoded industrial model of education. Large lecture theaters, multiple choice exams, an emphasis on timeliness, attendance, memorization, and following instructions, all were designed to create graduates ideal for the industrial manufacturing economy of the 1930s. In the 21st century, instead of just scaling this industrial model, we need to look at re-engineering it entirely to create graduates who are optimized for a knowledge economy. In the past decade or so, some of the highest profile innovations in teaching and learning, like lecture capture, flipping the classroom, massive open online courses, have made the mistake of essentially just taking that outmoded model of delivery, the lecture, and scaling up the room so that instead of a thousand students, you can teach 300,000 students at once. There's a well-established and well-known metaphor for understanding the various modalities of teaching and learning called the learning pyramid. The relative proportion of the various slices is in much dispute, but there's no question that for certain teachers, certain students, and certain subjects, there are a range of ideal ways in which to communicate content. The passive modes of learning include lecture, reading, watching videos, and watching demonstrations. But it's the active modes of teaching that are often overlooked in classrooms today. And many school boards, university and college academic plans are emphasizing the need to encourage the use of these techniques. They range from small group discussion and project-based learning to peer teaching opportunities that can be quite powerful as a teaching tool. Next time we'll take a look in more depth at active learning and how it's transforming the architecture of the modern classroom. So you don't miss it, take a moment now to subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or by email. Thanks again for taking 10 with me. Before you go, I want to share a dynamic new commercial for Trinity Western University. It's a 90-second spot full of energetic music and fast-paced visuals. I think it's telling that only 1.5 seconds are spent in a lecture theater at about the 46-second mark. Here are some excerpts, just in case you missed it. On it.